Guess what I got from Micro Center? All right, it's stipulated that it comes in a really big box. This is like twice the size of normal 32 inch 4K monitor boxes. And I've ripped the side out of it because they use cardboard that's a little too cheap. That's not environmentally friendly. I won't stand for this. This. This is the Acer Predator XB323QK. This is 4K, 120 hertz native, 144 hertz with some magic. Yeah, 4K, 144 hertz. Can you even do that in DisplayPort 1.4? Well, there's an asterisk with that. It also has HDMI 2.1 input, so your Xbox Series S or Series X or your PS5 can do 120 hertz FreeSync. Well, it's actually NVIDIA G-Sync built in. And uh, USB-C, DisplayPort, some other inputs, good for laptops, good for some other stuff. We're gonna take a look. Let's, uh, let's do a deep dive. <laughs> All right, so I got this one on sale at Micro Center for about 900 US. And this was assembled in July of 2021. So it sat around for a little while. It's uh, currently December 2021, or just about December. By the time you're watching this, probably December. So it's been sitting around. I think this monitor launched at around $1,200, but with the global situation and a whole bunch of other things, things are weird. This is also an IPS type panel. IPS type panels are not really known for gaming. on me. IPS panels are not really known for gaming, but this monitor claims 144 hertz. All right, fine. The Acer Predator line, I mean, that's their, their best of the best, the highest end of the highest end. And yet, Minolta Color Analyzer CA410, here is the color calibration testing report that came with this display. Some of the really early purchasers of this display did not get this. There was not a color calibration out of the box. But this one, at least since July, they definitely have color calibration, at least the ones here sold in the US. And uh, this is an sRGB pre-tuned profile. This is a very color accurate monitor, but not if it's not been calibrated, because then it's consistently not calibrated. That's the thing that you have to worry about. It's kind of strange, I know, yeah. All right, well, let's do some testing. So what do you get in the box bundle? You get a power cord, a USB-C cable, an HDMI 2.1 cable, a USB type A to type B, five gigabit cable, because it has a five gigabit USB hub built in, a little cable management bracket thingy, and of course a DisplayPort cable, which we will test. We'll test the cables on the DisplayPort cable tester. Now this display has four inputs, two HDMI 2.1, one DisplayPort 1.4, and one USB-C DisplayPort. Now to be sure that's just DisplayPort over a different physical connector, it's not, actually both at the same time. You have to use the separate USB type B input if you want to also have USB hub functionality on your display. It does support USB charging up to 65 watts and you can control if that's on or off through the on-screen menu. Kind of a nice feature. You can charge your phone off your, your monitor, something like that, that'd be okay. The input latency is pretty interesting. So yeah, up to 144 Hertz. We'll just do a quick input latency test and check and see. Oh yeah, the input cycle time on this thing, oh, it's forever. Four inputs, it takes about five or six seconds to cycle through each one. So it doesn't really do a great job uh, detecting the, the input. You sort of have to go around and around and around and, and around. It does have some really cool lighting on the back of the monitor that you can control, some RGB gamer stuff. Uh, Acer does sell a version of this monitor that's a little cheaper that uh, doesn't have that. Why aren't you waking up, monitor? Hello? You know, a really important thing to test on monitors is if you change the input to like input two and you turn off auto, will it let you bring up the on-screen display to change the input? You'd be surprised how many monitors won't actually let you change the input if there's no input. That works fine on this monitor. All right, so we've got about 9.4 milliseconds at the top, but you know, that might sound not great, but at the bottom, we've got 18.5. All right, so what's going on here 
is it's actually buffering the frame for just a little bit and the panel itself is running at a higher refresh than 60 hertz. This is a pretty basic test. So in 1 60th of a second, it takes 16 milliseconds, 16.6 .6 milliseconds to display that frame. Because this panel can run at a higher refresh than that and it's been tuned and calibrated to do that because you'd be surprised what that will do to a panel when you overdrive it. This is actually waiting a little bit to start displaying it so that by the time it gets down to the end, 16 milliseconds will have passed the same as you would expect in a standard 60 hertz display. So it is buffering it for a little bit, but not a lot. It turns out that the actual input latency on this monitor, it's on the order of about 2.5 milliseconds. And it does change a little bit if you change the overdriver setting in the on-screen display. So this is with the extreme setting, but with the normal or off setting, it's only about 0.75 milliseconds worse. So less than one millisecond variation between extreme and regular, at least with this test. And we need to repeat this test at a higher refresh rate, but we're off to a pretty good start. Now IPS panels have IPS glow. Anybody that's in the know about monitors and they're watching monitor reviews, they always wanna know about IPS glow. And that is when you're in a black room and the screen is black but on, what does that look like? Well, this has an LED backlight, so the backlight consistency is quite good. There is a little bit of bloom and IPS glow as you'd expect, but this is one of the best panels that I've ever seen for IPS glow. Well, the results are in on this monitor and it's particularly interesting. For an IPS display that has overdriver, the text scrolling performance on this display is spectacular. I was not expecting a result this good in terms of you know, that kind of result, because it's basically black and white. It's a worst case scenario for an IPS display. And at 120 hertz, it seemed to be the sweet spot. Moving from 120 hertz to 144 hertz, it's kind of diminishing returns. If we look at the Chase Squares test, we can see that even at 120 hertz, in some of the frames from the high speed footage, we can see that multiple squares are on at once. That means the panel simply can't respond fast enough uh, for the input signal. On a display like the LG CX, which is OLED, you're only ever gonna get one square on the screen at a time because the OLEDs turn on and off very rapidly. And that's the, the part here that's interesting. The global situation has made things strange, for sure. At $900, is this a good deal? Well, for a PC monitor with four inputs, yeah, that's a pretty good deal. But given the availability of OLED displays that are over 40 inches for around $1,000, then it's like, okay, well, you could maybe get that. But that's an HDMI only display. This has DisplayPort and two HDMI 2.1, which is great for consoles. You can have your Xbox and your PS5 both hooked up. And then you've also got DisplayPort, which is the superior interface versus HDMI. So it's a very weird situation. At like $600, it would be a no-brainer, but again, you get professional calibration. Now we did our own color calibration profile test on this with the, uh, you know, the display cal software and the uh, and the colorometer, and it did really well. It was really close to this, and I think it was overall very well calibrated out of the box, which is good for color accuracy. They advertise 90% DCI-P3, and it is 90% DCI-P3. One other thing that's interesting in the color menu, I noticed when we were doing the calibration, it does have a Rec 709 mode. It really, really blew out the greens according to the colorometer, but uh, it seems as though you could set a, a 709 profile and maybe get a little bit more mileage out of it. I'm not really sure how to test that. Maybe that's something I could revisit in a video. The color profile in general for like DCI P3 and sRGB coverage seem to be worse when doing the uh, color calibration, but maybe I'm not understanding something about how Rec 709 should be calibrated with a colorometer. So if you want to share or explain it or have a test regimen that I can run through to see if this really is a Rec 709 monitor, then join me in the level one forums because if it is a Rec 709 capable monitor, truly, then the price really not bad. It's also display HDR 400, which is kind of the lowest rung of HDR displays. So this is not a display that you should buy for the HDR feature. It's just a very basic HDR feature. I think I should cover HDR testing in a separate video, but just know that this is not a display that's really out of the park for, for something like HDR. But for an IPS display with an LED backlight, it is best in class in terms of bloom performance. It is best in class in terms of things like text scrolling. So if you want a monitor that can game, but also is good for professional work, this is probably not a bad choice 
pricing notwithstanding. It's nice that it's got two USB 3 ports on the bottom and it's got two USB 3 ports on the side, one of which can do charging. It's a very nice feature, but you know, is it worth a price premium? Well, now Acer sells another version of this monitor that's not the Predator version, but it's basically the same panel and the same setup. The on-screen display, I was a little surprised that it can't do picture by picture by picture by picture, basically a four up display from each of its four inputs. I looked for that option, wasn't really able to do that. I also noted that when you're running at 120 or 144 hertz through the DisplayPort interface, it doesn't really give you a lot of control over the overdriver option. There's blue light and gamma control and some other neat stuff in the on-screen display, but it doesn't really give you a ton of control. I found the best results for color matching and display and all that kind of thing to turn eco mode off, thanks California, and set the display mode to user mode um, for the most balanced and color accurate setup out of the box. If you're looking at displays in general that are based around IPS and you have one that does 120 hertz and one that does 144 hertz, it's diminishing returns. I would not really consider that a differentiating factor. Oh yeah, you can do 144. You can overclock this to 165 hertz. Don't recommend it, but it's, like I say, diminishing returns. Now, I mentioned that DisplayPort 1.4, the absolute maximum bandwidth here is 4K 120 hertz. That is absolutely true. There's a thing that enters the equation called display stream compression, which is, you know, the interface from your monitor to your graphics card historically has not been a compressed interface, meaning the data is not compressed. You can use display stream compression. That works really well because it's super compressible because most of the pixels on the display are exactly the same and it's traveling at an unbelievably high speed rate. So display stream compression losslessly compresses mostly the information on the wire so everything works really well. 389G 1875AAA FDD 140020140722223. That's this cable's part number or serial number. Looks like the initials JH are on the back. An inexpensive snap together design with a push button release. It says DP8K on it, 8K. that was at 8 gigabit. Let's try 10 gigabit, just for giggles. Now 10 gigabit is not required for the DisplayPort 1.4 spec, but gosh darn it, I'm noticing a pattern. The better cables tend to be able to do 10 gigabit. So even at 10 gigabit, this cable passes. Now notice the eye diagrams. If you compare them, you can see, oh, things are getting a little bit more wobbly. Uh, that part in the middle, ideally you wanna keep the signal as far away from that little cross in the middle as possible. And you can see that at 10 gigabit, oh, it starts to encroach on things just a little bit. But that's great that Acer bundles such a good quality cable with this monitor. When I get the uh, Asus PG43UQ last year, it didn't even pass 4K60 would drop out and turn black sometimes. And that was with the bundled cable. DisplayPort cables themselves, well, there's four channels on those. And as we saw from our cable tester, the cable that came with this display is adequate. Four channels can deliver eight point something gigabits per second on each channel. That's 32 gigabit. That's the DisplayPort 1.4 specification. Perfect. I like the display stand and the fit and finish of the monitor. It's a plastic construction. It's a little bulbous, a little bulky on the back. It's got the RGB lighting. I'm not really a fan of the RGB, but you know, you can control that through the on-screen display. You can set it up. It comes in a nice teal color out of the box. It does provide a nice wall glow if you're into that kind of thing. It is a standard 100 millimeter Visa mount underneath the stand mount. And the stand mount does have separate uh, pivot and height adjustment as well as uh, rotation. So it's a full featured monitor stand. It's uh, it's definitely a higher end solution. Assembly couldn't be easier. It basically just snaps together. So no complaints there. Overall, the verdict, Acer's put together a really good package. It's gonna come down to pricing and value in the market and what you're looking for. If you're looking for like the highest, cleanest, best, sharpest image for gaming and you can go bigger than 32 inches, you know, your desk or whatever supports it, you could go with a TV that has 120 hertz input. That's gonna be HDMI only, it's not gonna be DisplayPort. I would really love to have something like an OLED computer monitor, but those are over three grand. So this is kind of in, in the no man's land sort of between there. IPS, tried and true, it's a known quantity in terms of technology. It's gonna have better uh, age and wear characteristics than an OLED display that is used consistently. In terms of other displays that are available in the market, I'm, I'm aware of the ASUS PG32. I've got one of those to take a look at. The pros and cons for that display are pretty similar to the pros and cons for this display. There's not really a lot of differentiating factors between those two displays. It really just comes down to price and, and some other features. And watch for that ASUS review so we can sort of 
compare these, but so far what I'm seeing, not really a lot of difference. Uh, I mean, you know, you get the Asus accoutrement versus the Acer accoutrement, but in terms of panel and the nitty gritty, yeah. It is a very high-end gaming panel overall, works great on a PC or console, whatever you wanna use it for. I'm Wendell, this is Level One, I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level One forums if you have any other questions or if there's anything that I missed. Signing out, and I'll see you there.